face and it is early guys i woke up early so that's awesome and i figured i would do my recap nice and early let's can i fix this all right good morning everyone for real this time it is early in the morning i finished judges yesterday and recap time let's chat about the book of judges i figured we would do this book a little differently because i also have something to share with you guys um i created like a little overview i think i've done this before for the book of acts this is just what it looks like and you can find that on my website it'll be linked down below it's a free downloadable i'm gonna try not to sniffle so much because that's the worst part of editing is when i sniffle like every other sentence because then i'm cutting every other sentence so i created this outline with a lot of the overview information that i typically chat with you about when i look through my other bibles and commentaries and just figure out what the overarching theme and purpose of a book is outlines um timeline different things so we can go through it and then we can get into the book i figured for this book i would do it a different little differently um i did want to instead of going i typically go chapter by chapter but i figured i could go like judge by judge for the most part like once we get there it's broken up into three parts so it is so early guys i'm so tired so my life was my life happy? one of the bibles said that the theme the downward spiral israel's national and spiritual life into chaos and rebellion against god showing the need for a godly king and that's just because they would not acknowledge god as their king as their ruler the key verse for this book is judges 17 6. in those days there was no king in israel everyone did what was right in his own eyes um and that's a scary place to be when you have disregarded god and you're just doing what you think is right versus what's right in god's eyes throughout the whole book we see that it says israel did evil in the sight of the lord and then it switches over to and everyone did what was right in his own eyes um and then like the purpose of the book was to show god's judgment against sin is certain and his forgiveness of sin and restoration to relationship are just as certain for those who repent and we see that over and over again especially with the lord providing judges he's showing his grace and mercy upon these people that were doing things against him okay then uh, the book is broken down into three parts some books break it down into four parts but three parts is easier the first part is the root of Israel's unfaithfulness, their military failure, their inability to completely take over the land and their inheritance, um, and then obviously religious um, rebellion that comes when, you know, these people that are still living on the land worship other gods and you fall into the trap too. The second part um, was, you know, the period of the judges, just the, the different judges some people say there's 11 12 possibly 13 there's like some people acknowledge one guy as a judge or not like we'll get there when we go through the judges but yeah the last section is the depths of israel's unfaithfulness you know their moral failure idolatry from the tribe of dan and then war against the tribe of benjamin um even though the lord uh does give them victory over that they're now not only are they fighting other enemies now they're fighting against each other something i did was bible hub gives an excellent summary of each book if you're ever a little confused or before you start a book you want to know what the book is about bible hub is a great resource and i liked they gave like four words to describe the book of judges and i like that so the first word was sin and it's israel turns from the living god slavery god allows pagan nations to occupy the land and you know israel is oppressed multiple times supplication israel forsakes its sin and prays for deliverance and in salvation god graciously rises up judges to deliver israel and it's kind of like the cycle that they were stuck in um you'll see it i need to add that into my bible but let's get right into 
the book. Let's chat. I have my Bible and my notes. And let's do this. I'm so tired. Ooh. So, right when we start Judges chapter 1 and chapter 2, we see that the tribes of Israel go into the land and fail to completely conquer their inheritance. The first of the tribes was Judah to go, and it even says in verse 19 of chapter 1, it says, And the Lord was with Judah. So they had all the power in the strength they needed the lord was on their side but they still failed to conquer um we see it in 21 but the people of benjamin did not drive out the jebusites 27 manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of beth sheen um 29 and ephraim did not drive out the canaanites zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of kitron asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Ako Ako and the inhabitants of Sidon, and the list goes on and on for the rest of chapter one. A pattern we see is if they did not drive them out completely, they either inhabited the land together or they put that other nation into forced labor. So we see right from the start, they do not complete the Lord's commandment. And in the beginning of chapter two, we see that the Lord is angry with them. He says, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they will become thorns in your sides and their gods which shall be a snare to you. And... We just see how quickly Israel went downhill, as do all of us. I think that's why sometimes reading these Old Testament books and you're seeing the Israelites clearly make the wrong mistakes over and over and over again. But that is still how many of us Christians are living today. We're constantly just making, we're stuck in this like cycle of sin where we come to God with forgiveness. Um, we come to God for forgiveness. Um, he gives us his grace and mercy. We are enticed by the world. We fall into sin with the world. And then we come back to God. And we never break this cycle of sin. It's like uh, we're reading our Hebrew book. Um, Holiest of all. I mention it all the time. And this last chapter, it compared the Christian to the priest that worked at the tabernacle. And how some Christians were... Christians that were on the outer court where they were they're saved they know Christ but that's as far as they go then it compares other Christians to the priests we're in the inner courts we're a little closer but we're still there's still something missing there like uh, and they considered like the first Christians more the ones that say I'm saved I can still live like the world the other ones more I'm coming to God but I'm still trying to work on things myself there's still a slight disconnect and then there's those that walk into the holy of holies as the high priest did once a year but obviously we got direct access um and how though we are not perfect we are constantly abiding and trying to live to glorify and honor god and it's just different walks of life and it talks about that a lot in that book that book's very encouraging and convicting so if you want to read it i highly suggest it read it very slowly because it's it's very good but there's so much in it um and yeah uh i think that's a perfect representation of christians today christians in israel's time because as we'll see like god judged them as a whole but there were still some that praised the lord and worshipped him so off my little tangent now and then we see how Israel fails to tell the next generation of the Lord, of all he did, of who he is, and just how powerful um, the Lord truly is compared to these other gods. Um, verse 10, it says, And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And I think that's their biggest failure. Um, I know when my pastor preached this, he was like, it starts in the home and then it moves outward. And it's very true. It's it's just amazing how quickly 
you know, a whole new generation grew up without the Lord, without knowing who he was after their parents went through so much to get into the promised land, how their grandparents suffered in the wilderness for 40 years and just everything that the Lord has done in, in truly a short amount of time. But I think of today, even in America, so many of us don't know history and we can get into that but we're not going to that's not what this channel is about but to make a comparison there is so much unknown or not taught or taught incorrectly and when you don't know history you repeat history when you don't know history you fall into the snare of the devil and that's why it's so important to know God's word, to know our biblical history. These are actual accounts in just history itself, but to know how the Lord has worked. But also it's important to just know history in general, to know what has happened in our life and the lifetimes before us. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and they served the Baals. Um, they served many different gods, gods that the Lord delivered them from, from Egypt, which is crazy. Um, you see the, the full cycle. They don't know their history, so they go back to serving these gods that did nothing for them back in Egypt. I have a lot of notes here. So, uh, God was, uh, was angry at Israel and he allowed them to be punished by their enemies. Anger in itself is not sin. God's anger was a reaction of his holy nature to sin. Um, one side of God's nature is anger against sin and the other is his love and mercy towards sinners. Despite Israel's disobedience, God showed his great mercy by providing judges mm -hmm. to save the people from their oppressors. You know, mercy is, it's not getting a punishment we deserve. And our disobedience demands judgment. Very important. In verse 16, it says, Then the Lord raised judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plunder them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after the other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge. But whenever the judge died, they, meaning Israel, turned back, and they were corrupt, more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them, bowing down to them. And that's like something we see is that as you keep going, it's like they were serving this God. Everything happens, cycle goes through the next time they're serving this God and this God. And the list grows and grows and grows and they become more and more corrupt. Um, it says, for they hoard after other gods. We see this in Ezekiel and in Hosea. Hosea uh, was the prophet that the Lord commanded him to marry a prostitute. And he was just kind of like a living example of the way the Lord felt with the people of Israel. Um, you know, they're, they're described as committing adultery against the Lord by following these other gods. Uh, another commandment that the Israelites failed to keep, and that was intermarrying with other nations. Um, 3, 6, it says, And their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. Um, this was another act of disobedience to God's commandment in Deuteronomy 7, 3 about no intermarrying. So that's kind of like the intro of judges and just how Israel got to where they are and why they needed a judge and yeah some of these judges we get a lot of information on some we don't so we're just gonna go for it there's definitely more information on all these judges on all these things that you can get elsewhere if you study deeper okay judge number one our first judge um, Othenio, and it always starts off with, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot their God and served Baals and Asheroth. And you know, before before God even sent them, um, judges, it says that they served Baals. The spirit of the Lord was upon him, Othenio, and he judged Israel. Um, these judges were they were military leaders and. They were providing rest for the most part they were military leaders deborah wasn't but he he was providing these people were oppressed and the enemies were coming in taking over 
and so they needed someone to lead them so that's typically what these judges did not only that they was the spirit of the lord upon them and they judged the people and kept the rest in the land they also were that military leader that they needed well then you know, he um he was empowered by the lord and the land had rest for 40 years it doesn't say he judged for 40 years but it said that he had rest for 40 years so um for ehud once again it says and the people of israel again did what was evil in the sight of the lord and the people were oppressed and served eglon and the king of moab 18 years so they were oppressed for 18 years ehud was of the tribe of benjamin and he was a left-handed man and i know in some commentaries it says like this was a weakness this was looked upon as a weakness but every time i've looked up the benjamin the benjaminites and how they most of them were left-handed i always read how that was a strength in their military strategy because they were able to use both hands or like trick an enemy into thinking they were you know it was like an, an uh military tactic too so he was an excellent um what you call it so he helped deliver the people against who those who were invading in and the land had 80 years of rest up to you myself in right at the end of chapter 3 verse 31 it says after him was shamgar the son of anath who killed 600 of the philistines with an ox goad and he also saved israel it doesn't necessarily say he was a judge but it says he was after him after he had so take that as you will um next we see deborah and it starts off with and the people of israel again did what was evil in the sight of the lord after he had died um and deborah she was a prophetess first and a judge second and i think that's important because it shows that she was one who was with the lord who worshiped the lord who did not fall into the rebellious act of idolatry you know the people were being oppressed and they needed a military leader but the lord first sent them someone who would bring them back to him versus someone who would just save them and chapters four and five kind of coincide when my pastor preached it he's like if you read both of them you have to read them together because chapter five will tell you why things are happening in chapter four and so on and so forth something i thought was interesting was that in chapter four verse one here in my esv it says the people of israel in kjv it says the children of israel and i just thought it was interesting that the lord was uh, referring to the nation of israel as children um probably literally meaning that you know a whole new generation of them not knowing but also just how they were acting during deborah's time too the lord used two women to help give them victories i'm trying to like keep my notes together because i wrote them all broken but chapter four goes through the story we have deborah and then as she is ministering to the people she calls out or she calls out her barack 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 am i saying his name right barack yeah the lord calls up barack to lead them in a military um as the military leader and he even uses another woman jl to help them gain victories over their enemies as she defeats what's it the king so the lord was using a lot of people during this um and as you read through chapter five her song and breaks down what's happening you see that there was a lack of responsibility between the elders the leaders and the parents for not teaching the youth about the lord because deborah caused them to remember the power of god to rehearse the acts of god and to share the true god you know these people were giving themselves to these new gods and just willingly sacrificing themselves and just doing all these things but not serving the true god after deborah the land had rest for 40 years right before we get to gideon in 6 8 it says the lord sent a prophet to the people of israel and he said to them thus says the lord the god of israel i led you up from egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery and i've delivered you from the hand of the egyptians or from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove you out from before you and gave you their land and i said to you i am the lord your god you shall not fear the gods of the amorites and do in whose land you dwell but you have not obeyed my voice and i think it's interesting that the lord sent another prophet it doesn't necessarily say it was a judge it just says and the lord sent a prophet but 
he sent this prophet there to remind the people, I am the Lord. Just look at all that I've done. These other gods have not done anything for them. And that section, section, it says the, you know, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They had been oppressed for about eight years. Let me see, seven years, seven years. And then we see the call of Gideon. During this time, the enemies were so forceful that the Israelites would hide. They would hide to do everything, farming and doing all that stuff. They would they would hide or do it in secret because or else the enemies would come upon and, you know, take all their food, take everything. It was just a terrible time. And the Lord of uh, the angel of the Lord finds Gideon beating the beating the sheaves, you know, wheat and he finds him doing that in hiding and um and he says the lord is with the old man of valor um and it's like a little bit of sarcasm because you know this they're they're doing so many things out in hiding there was no confidence in anything for them there was no confidence in the lord for them because they they had turned away from the lord and but it's also kind of a hint to who Gideon will be. The Lord doesn't just see us as who we are. He sees us as who we will be and should be and he can call us out on that. And something that was interesting was the two, um, if you read it, the two different um, ways that Lord and Lord are. When the, it says, and the Lord turned to Gideon, like the Lord is talking to him. It's L-O-R-D, all caps. Um, but when Gideon is responding, it's L-O-R-D, lowercase. He did not know who he was talking to. And that could be just failed teaching from the generations. You know, it wasn't until later on that he realized that he was talking to the Lord face to face. And that's when Lord gets capitalized after his conversations. But even then, you see Gideon's lack of confidence in the Lord. You know, his first task is to destroy the altars that have been built. He does this at night, you know, out of fear. But it took 10 men to break down these altars, which I think is wild. Like, what did they build? Um, you know, these these gods had become a part of the family, part of the community, a part of everything. Like, they truly put their all into this. I think the way that they served these gods was so different than the way that they served the Lord, even when they were faithful to him, because they, you know, with these gods they had them in their homes had huge statues and all these things for them and i feel like it was almost a, a different type of slavery to these gods versus a a loving relationship with your god and that's the contrast i see it was almost like they were enslaved to these idols in a very literal sense the people were angry that Gideon did this and they actually wanted to kill him but his father actually is the one that spoke up and said like will you contend for Baal or will you save him whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning if he is God let him contend for himself basically saying like oh if he's if he's really a god he will take care of Gideon himself which obviously he doesn't and then it says that Gideon was clothed with the spirit of the Lord which I think is the only time in this book that we see that phrasing of it that he was clothed with the spirit of the Lord um, I know with Samson we see that the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Other people were like, they had the spirit of the Lord upon them. So, and then after this, they, they called him Jeroboam, which means contender with Baal. So that's kind of like the first half of Gideon. And then, you know, the second half of Gideon is, it starts off with him testing the Lord with like the fleece where he's like, oh, if you're truly the Lord, it will... No, or if you will, he's like, if you will truly save Israel, then the fleece will be wet. And he goes, I need you to do it again. If the fleece is dry, then and just like different testing along uh, before the Lord. And I just feel like that was a lack of confidence and also a lack of knowledge of knowing who God is and that he is and does what he says he will do. Later on, after they are successful and, you know, they are brought to victory, the people want Gideon to rule over them as king. Gideon knew enough. You know, he had enough. He he knew enough of the Lord to know that 
he was not the one that who was to rule over them it was god he says in 823 i will not rule over you and my son will not rule over you but the lord will rule over you and this is like the people's rejection all the time of the lord ruling over them they wanted man to rule over them versus god they wanted a ruler they wanted someone that they can physically see to tell them what to do tell them what was right and lead them versus the lord who is all powerful and almighty not knowing to lead them eventually gideon made an afad and put it in the city they don't really say what his intention of this was it may not have been a, a worship this afad like be, make this idol like make this into idolatry we don't know but the people do fall into idolatry because they start worshiping this afad and um you know fall into sin you know even though the lord chose him to lead it doesn't mean that he was imperfect um, you know, he had many sons from more than just wife and Abimelech, one of his sons from his concubine, caused many division between the family and the nation. He murdered all his brothers, 70 except for one, and he actually ruled for three years. They made him a sort of king ruling over them. Um, and it says there, and it says that the Lord sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of the, um, nation that were following him um this was part of the curse of joath because he declared to them like this is not right you know um and then eventually abimelech is killed in battle but many people die and this is very similar to the battle with um the benjamites at the end you see that the people are fighting and fighting and losing like abimelech seems to be overtaking them at every turn until you know he's finally killed but I think that just shows, you know, sin has a consequence and unfortunately here the consequence was straight up death. There was a lot of lives lost but there, there was a lot of sin. As we move on from Gideon, you have Tola who judged Israel for 23 years. And then you have J.R. J. J. And he judged Israel 22 years. So another two judges. There's really not too much about them. It talks about like the, kid, the amount of kids that they had. I didn't look too much into it. The next judge was Jeff, Jephath. I don't know. These names, guys. Jephthah. And he was basically appointed by the people. Before that, it says... The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baals and Asheroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Sidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of Amorites and the gods of the Philistines. The list is growing. He was the son of a prostitute and so his brothers um, did not care for him. He fled from them and it says that, let me read it, it says, Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. Which, that is the same phrase to describe the men in Judges 19.22. The men in the town, the city in Benjamin that committed horrific acts. And they are described as worthless fellows too. So I think this just gives you kind of like a overview of his character, of who he was. Um later on he was a great man of uh war like a mighty warrior and it says that you know when the amorites made war against Israel, the elders of Gil gilad Gil gilly says the leaders basically were like please come and be our leader you know fix our problems they kick him out and then they say fix our problems jephthah had enough knowledge of god i don't know how much faith but he was very foolish but the lord did spiritually empower jephthah Jeff, what, what his name is, but he does make like a foolish vow and he does proclaim that who that he would sacrifice whatever walks out of his house. The first thing to walk out of his house if he is successful. In one of my Bibles, it was saying that the words used in the Hebrew could be translated as what or who. So there's a part of him that knew he would possibly ha be having to sacrifice a person, which is against the mosaic law but he was successful and the first person to come out 
was his daughter his only daughter he had no sons he had no other daughters he had one child and it was her according to his vow that would be his sacrifice and according to the mosaic law you don't keep a vow it's going to cause you to sin and it, then again who knows how much they knew at this point of the laws so he didn't have to sacrifice her but he felt like he had to keep his vow people say different things uh some people believe he really did um sacrifice his daughter after a few months of uh and some people believe that he sacrificed her to a life of virginity um meaning that since she was his only child his family line would end there since she would not marry I'm not sure i will say i thought it was interesting the daughter's reaction to this because he tells her this and she's kind of like do what you have to do which i thought was very interesting um uh, not how i would react um and he judged israel for six years then after him was Ibz ibzan and he judged for seven years elon judged for 10 years and then Ab abdon judged for eight years and then israel was oppressed for 40 years by the Philistines after this and then we get into the story of Samson first it starts off with his parents and it says um, you know that the angel of the Lord appeared to his mother and told her that though she is barren she um, will bear a son and she is to not drink strong drink or eat anything unclean because uh, oh and that her son is to never have you know cut his hair for he shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb number six is where it talks about like the Nazarite vow um, it was a person who took a vow to be set apart for God's service um, when she tells her husband all this I find his his reaction this is what reminds me that there were still people that still worshiped the true God because his reaction was oh Lord let the man of God whom you sent again to us teach us what we are going to do with the child which is to be born he didn't doubt that she would get pregnant he did not um mock it he was just like well if that's what the lord said lord help us give he prayed for guidance on how to um raise this child for the lord and i think that's an amazing reaction to god's promise promise that might seem impossible um the angel of the lord does reappear and tells them again and his response to the angel of the lord it wasn't what did you tell my wife tell us again it says when your words come true there was faith and confidence in the words that the angel of the lord had given them so you know samson's parents just remind me that no matter how rebellious people can get there are still those who worship the true king the true lord um and then we get into samson and samson's a messy man he is a messy man um we know the spirit of the lord was upon him since his since he was in the womb and even though he's empowered by the lord samson's desires ruled him when he's telling his parents who he wants for a wife um he keeps repeating that she is right in my eyes she was right in the eyes of samson and though the lord was behind this it shows his heart and where that was um because it reminded me of genesis 3 6 with eve when the serpent was talking to her about the fruit she saw that it was right in her eyes she found desire of it in her eyes um then he violates the nazarite law by touching the carcass of the lion and then he put out a riddle to the Philistines and his wife he ends up telling his wife the answer and she tells it to the men and he's angry about that and then she was actually given to wife a different man he judged for 20 years um, I don't know when in that time that you know it's towards the end of his judging his ruling that he falls in love well we see that there are three women in his life that they tell us about his first wife a prostitute and delilah all philistine women um and he falls in love with delilah and 
she ends up working with the Philistines um, for 1100 pieces of silver to bring him down and to find out his secret. And you would think that Samson would learn from his past um, with his first wife, or even the fact that Delilah showed him who she was, not once, not twice, but three times, and he, he didn't. Um, and something that I found really sad was once his hair was cut off and, you know, she's like, the Philistines are coming. It says he did not know that the Lord had left him, which I find so interesting. So I'm like, imagine you from the womb being empowered by the Holy Spirit and not realizing that the Lord has gone. Yeah, I just thought that was so interesting that he himself did not. Does that say that he was so far gone in his life? or just that it was something that was hidden from him. Samson did not realize that the Lord was no longer with him. The Philistines are able to capture him, they blind him, they, um, you know, and they bring him into wherever they were all getting together. And there were like over 3,000 men there. And the Lord is always merciful. And, you know, very importantly in verse 22 it says, but the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. And it's kind of like a foretelling of his strength. Um, you know, Samson makes one last plea to the Lord for strength so he can destroy the Philistines there with himself. And that is exactly what he does. And it says that he defeated more than he had during his lifetime, which is amazing. Um, and, and then we get into the rest of Judges. And I'm so excited. Let's see how quick I can do this last section. So now we're at about chapter 17. Um, and the rest of Judges is basically unhinged retelling of these people's craziness and their crazy sin. So yeah, be aware. Um, I read somewhere in one of the, when I was like looking up something else, it was like, if you are discouraged, you are sad, do not read Judges. And you know what? I agree. Because there's just, though you can see the grace and mercy and love that the Lord has to give, this book is really a book of the consequences of sin and rebelling against the Lord. Um, yeah. So, Verse 17, 6, we see, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Um, and that is a huge issue. Um, doing what is right in your own eyes leads to chaos and corruption. Um, and then here we see the story of Micah and the Levite, um, which I have many questions. I would have to do much more research, but it's just kind of like a story of delusion um we have micah a man who essentially uh well it says he said to his mother the 1100 pieces of silver that were taken from you and it just goes on and on which i thought was interesting because that's the same price delilah was paid um so i thought that connection was interesting but they get um carved images and then a fod made in the house of micah and he had a shrine, um, he had his household gods, and he had ordained one of his sons to become a priest, which he is not of the Levite, the tribe of Levite, so I delusion. And then it says that there was a man of Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah. So me reading that, of the family of Judah, to me that sounds like he's of the tribe of Judah, of the, the lineage of Judah. How is he a Levite? Because there's another guy. So I'm like, was this guy also just delusional too? Am I missing something? Some commentators are saying that he was just staying in Judah, but it says of the family of Judah. So I don't know. It just sounds like these people were all delusional in their little worlds that they were living in. Essentially, Micah built an altar of idols to other gods, all this stuff, a shrine has his son being a priest and then finds this Levite and says, come be a priest for me. I'll pay you. It'll be much better. And, and the priest, the, the Levite, whether he's a true Levite or not, he entertains this chaos. He entertains this delusion. It says, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man and the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite and the young man became his priest. Micah said, 
Now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. The delusion continues. Guys, this man really thought that the Lord would bless him for having altars to different gods and having a Levite priest who was now in sin. The delusion. The, the, it's just mind boggling. I think this shows you how corrupt things had gotten. That a Levite, a supposed man of God, would find comfort in the home of an idol worshiper and become his priest. Also, it's he's also in sin for being a priest to one man when they are to serve the whole nation of Israel. Then we continue to read, and you know, because the tribe of Dan was not able to completely, you know, get their lands in order, um, they went out and sought out new land. And where did it bring them? Somewhere close to this man. They found people that were unsuspecting um, and they planned on taking over but they happened to run into the Levite for this guy find his home take all his gods take 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 like this priest they take his priest I'm pretty sure it says he, he was happy to go he was glad I just like the, the the chaos gets more chaotic over and over again and these people they they go, they take their land that they stole. They took all of Micah's stuff too. They invaded the land, stole Micah's ephod, his household god, his priests. They, they were just so clouded by their desire for wealth, truly, because they could not do what they needed to do, so they took it from someone else. Delusion. Then chapter 19, we're not gonna chat about. I'm not going over chapter 19. Chapter 19 is like the worst chapter of the whole entire Bible. It makes me very, very angry and i am not going to talk about it um if you read it you know what happens we're skipping over it i don't have the capacity to talk about this calmly so off to chapter 20 after the aftermath we know that in that chapter they call the men worthless fellows and i think that's important because that they bring that up again all that situations just bring so much turmoil between the tribes of israel and israel's you know rebellion leads to all the tribes coming together against benjamin yes the the city and Benjamin, those men were at fault. But look at how far they've gone that they're willing to fight their own. There's just so much chaos. The tribe of Benjamin refused to release their men, so now we have these nations fighting each other. And I find it interesting that it takes the nation of Israel up until this point, up until this tragic thing, which it was a tragic story, and then the man did what he did, and it just tells you where his heart was because he just instigated all of this in between the tribes. I just find it interesting that it takes them up until this to realize that they need to purge evil from Israel. Um, how far gone do we have to go? Do we have to be to truly realize we need the Lord? And this is the first time we finally start seeing the Lord interact with them again where they ask like, who do we send first? And he said, Judah will go first, go up against them. And he sends them over and over again because the just like with Abimelech the tribe of Benjamin was being successful there was a lot of death um, so much death to the point that when they are victorious um, they the tribe of Benjamin is so small it's easily it's easy to be depleted but the tribes of Israel have said they have made a vow that they would not give any of their daughters to the sons of Benjamin. So what do they do? They find a small town in Israel, still one of their own nations, that did not help them during this fight. They attack them, slaughter all the men and any woman that was not a virgin, and take their women and give them to the Benjamites. Like it's still like this twisted thinking. And that is just what happens when the Lord is removed so far out from your life, from your soul, from your mind, from the community, from your home. It's it's just, it's just crazy. That's what it is. It's crazy. It's true craziness. Um, it's a very sad turn of event. Um, and it's sad because the book also just ends with, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So... That is the book of judges there is a lot to unpack there there's a lot more we could have unpacked there and a lot of it is just sad it makes makes you sad thinking how far these people have gone 
um, and how lost they were. So yeah, that is the book of Judges. If you guys have stayed till the end, it's awesome. Don't forget to download your free um, outline. I'm pretty sure I mentioned this in the beginning. I was so tired when I first started this. It's been a while. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I will see you guys in my next one.